Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Nithi Bhatnagar from New Delhi, a radiologist who's heading the Department of Radiology at Chanandevi Hospital. I'd like to thank XP Connect GE for inviting me to present this webinar on sonographic findings of frozen shoulder today. And of course, I welcome all the listeners who are joining in uh, with us this evening. We will be now proceeding on to the actual webinar on frozen shoulder and its sonographic findings. So when we begin with the sonographic findings in the shoulder, I'd like to just proceed with a few of the salient features just to bring an overview about frozen shoulder. I begin with a bit of history about the popular term frozen shoulder. Dupley in 1872 called the condition as scapulohumeral periarthritis. And in 1934, it was Codman who for the first time coined the term frozen shoulder. It was then in 1945, Neviasa, who coined the term adhesive capsulitis and so began the entire disease pattern and its recognition. Difficult to define, difficult to treat, and difficult to explain from the point of view of pathology. This Codman's Assertion is really a fact today because of a variable nomenclature to this disease, an inconsistent overlap of the disease staging, and multiple kinds of treatments. So to define adhesive capsulitis, we go on to say that it's a condition of uncertain etiology which is characterized by varying degrees of pain and significant restriction of both active and passive shoulder motion that occurs in the absence of any known intrinsic shoulder disorder. There is a persistent disagreement about whether the underlying pathology of adhesive capsulitis is inflammatory, fibrosing condition, or algoneurodystrophic process. Evidence does suggest that there is a global synovial inflammation followed by capsular fibrosis, in which type 1 and type 3 collagen gets laid down with subsequent tissue contraction. Now, why does this contraction occur? There is an imbalance that has been studied and has been propounded through various theories, which is very aggressive. And the collagen, loss of collagen, and the loss of normal remodeling finally leads to the stiffening of the capsule and the ligamentous structures. A quick touch upon, upon the epidemiology, which I'm sure each one of us is quite aware, so I'll just quickly recap it, uh, that it's more commonly seen in women, usually the left shoulder, and in individuals between 40 to 65 years of age with an occurrence rate of approximately 2 to 5% in general population and 10 to 20% in the diabetic population. 5 to 34% may have the chance of having it in the contralateral shoulder at some point or the other. Simultaneous bilateral involvement has been found to occur in approximately 14% of the individuals. The presenting complaints usually start with pain associated with progressive stiffness and loss of particularly external rotation of the shoulder over a period of one to two years. Other movements of the shoulder may be affected depending upon the region of the capsule of the shoulder that may be affected. So the pain may be reported either anteriorly or posteriorly occasionally extending into the biceps tendon region or at the deltoid insertion, especially while resting in bed. However, in most of the cases, this pain really cannot be localized reliably. 
there is a strong component of night pain, pain with rapid or unguarded movements, discomfort on lying on the affected side of the shoulder, pain which is easily aggravated by smallest of the active passive movements, and the patient may present with the weakness of the ipsilateral shoulder. Radiographs, unfortunately, are typically negative with uncertain history of trauma. On clinical examination, shoulder joint exhibits a capsular pattern of restriction of movement. So what do we mean when we say a capsular type of restriction? This means that a movement which is defined as restriction mainly of the external rotation, which is more limited than abduction, and this is more limited than internal rotation. So to speak, internal rotation is minimally or hardly affected when we are talking of adhesive capsulitis. There is global loss of active and passive range of moment, and pain which is at the end range of the moment is quite classic. It is actually the predominant feature when we are performing a dynamic ultrasound to elicit the restriction of moment and documenting it. Especially in early stages of the diseases where probably no sonar sign has still not presented itself. It's important to emphasize that although a full range of motion may never be achieved, there is always a, uh, there is always a probability that the stiffness greatly reduces in a period of time. Another common concomitant condition with frozen shoulder is the overuse of cervical muscles leading to a spasm so that the patient keeps the shoulder hunched as you can be seen in this image here. Winging of the ipsilateral shoulder, a winging of the ipsilateral scapula is also a probability because it sometimes due to a lack of uh, a lack of use of the shoulder due to stiffness of the shoulder leading to um, the atrophy can cause the winging of the scapula in the later stage of the diseases and these two where the shoulder may be hunched or there could be a winging of the scapula you could always increase the diagnostic confidence. The most widely used clinical classification has been presented by Lundberg et al who classified the condition as primary when a clear cause could not be established and secondary, when adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder occurred after a definite history of injury or a history of surgery or under the subcategories of involvement of the systemic causes, extrinsic causes or intrinsic causes. Now, the commonest of course being the predisposing factors of having diabetes sometimes fractures and rotator cuff pathologies. It's granted and we understand that adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder is primarily a clinical exam. Yet, the cause of the painful stiff shoulder must be excluded, which are other causes, before a diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis is rendered. It can be extremely challenging to differentiate between early stages of adhesive capsulitis and other pathologies which give a stiff shoulder only through a clinical examination. The gold standard, of course, we know is MR arthrogram, but we all know that's an invasive procedure. The role of ultrasound in diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis remained very controversial for a long time. In fact, I was very surprised to find that Adhesive capsulitis was not included among clinical indications of musculoskeletal ultrasound issued by the European Society of Musculoskeletal Radiology up until 2012. Since then, many studies have come, and all these studies have propounded and illustrated very specific ultrasound findings that strongly help to orient the diagnosis with ease and accurate reproducibility. Literature reports that adhesive capsulitis progresses through three overlapping clinical phases. Freezing, also called as acute or painful phase, adhesive, frozen or stiffening phase, and last but not the least, of course, resolution or thawing phase. Now, as you can see from the, uh, from the slide here, 
how varied and wide the time distributions can be, which have got a great overlap between weeks, months, and to years as well. Ultrasound can help differentiate between the three phases, as well as identify any other underlying cause, such as fracture or radio cuff tears, tendinosis, impingements, or subacromial subdeltoid bursitis. For those of us who have joined as practicing musculoskeletal radiologists, do please bear with us for these initial introductory slides. So we have a quick run of the ultrasound protocols for the benefit of all who are perhaps joining us for the, uh, as beginners. Patients that's facing the radiologist do uh, apologize for the wrong spelling here. Patient sits facing the radiologist, and if the patient is frail, much in pain, he may lie supine with the affected shoulder closer to the operator. We combine the static grayscale imaging, dynamic scan, color Doppler imaging, and elastography where one feels the need there could be. Uh, high frequency, of course, linear probes from 5 to 12, 7 to 15 megahertz, as may be attached with the ultrasound units that the operator may be having. Warm gel, if possible, looking at the temperatures today. And of course, the asymptomatic shoulder should always be uncovered for the comparative analysis. Previous investigations for the perusal, if are available, do always help. The MSK settings on the machines so that the preset of the MSK is used with depth, focus, and gain as per the body habitus. And shoulder is used in neutral position, is put in the neutral position, palm is supinated, and elbow is flexed at 90 degrees. The scanning planes are usual as we do them for the ultrasound of a normal shoulder. The anterior transfer scan for coracohumeral ligament, oblique sagittal scan for rotator interval, and the auxiliary scan for the inferior glenohumeral in the oblique coronal planes. For assessment of the coracohumeral ligament, the medial end of the medial end of the probe is hinged on the lateral aspect of the coracoid process, aligned transversely or along the length of the coracoid process of the coracohumeral ligament from the coracoid process and going all the way up to the rotator interval. The shoulder, of course, stays in the neutral position. Rotator interval is scanned in cross or modified cross position, which may sometimes not be possible if the patient is in too much pain. So a modification can always be put in uh, so that the patient is comfortable and you are able to uncover the entire rotator interval for a proper analysis. In this, of course, the probe orientation, as you can see, is on the anterior shoulder in an oblique plane. Followed by this, we have the auxiliary evaluation and now this auxiliary evaluation is for the auxiliary recess the capsule which is there and the inferior glenohumeral ligament in this of course the arm is hyper abducted and the probe is oriented in a long axis scan all along the anatomical neck of the humerus There could be other scanning positions that can be easily utilized. So we've already spoken that if the patient is too much in pain, we can do, we can try and elicit the rotator interval in a neutral position. However, a modified cross or cross position definitely is the uh, need of the time. But there is another position which is called as a Mick Jagger maneuver. And this was uh, the singer of Rolling Stones. And this was a very popular move that he used to do while singing. And it helps a lot in case the patient is in pain to just hyper extend the shoulder. And the probe orientation gives a clear vision of the uh, rotator interval. So after we have gone over the basics of adhesive capsulitis, we come to the specific structures that we'd like to see on an ultrasound when we have a patient suffering from adhesive capsulitis. These are enumerated in the order of the high sensitivity and specificity on static imaging. The first, of course, we have so popularly keep repeating all the time the coracohumeral ligament. Then, of course, we talk about the shoulder capsule, which is anterior superior 
most commonly affected, and then in the axillary recess, rotator interval. The subcoracoid fat triangle has just been introduced, and it was introduced by Mengiardi et al., who showed that the obliteration of the subcoracoid triangular fat pad, which is inferior to the coracohumeral ligament, had the highest specificity, which is almost 100% if you see so, but has a low sensitivity. It's a difficult to um, elicit. This is followed, of course, by the dynamic scan, and this dynamic sign is primarily to elicit the restriction of external rotation, which is done through the exposition of subscapularis through the external rotation of the shoulder. So now I would definitely like to draw your attention to these illustrations, since they will guide you as a roadmap to understanding of the stru structures that are involved in the pathological process of adhesive capsulitis. The first image is the anterior view, where you can well uh, visualize the tendon of the subscapularis and the tendon of the supraspinatus, with in the intervening the long head of the biceps tendon, which pierces the capsule and then enters into the intertubercular groove. More important today is when we are concentrating on the coracohumeral ligament, which is the first stabilizer, of course, of the long head of the bicipital tendon, and it's a fibrous structure which extends from the coracoid process all the way laterally and downwards to take its insertion and blends with the supraspinatus and subscapularis tendon, and blends, of course, to take its insertion in the greater and the lesser tuberosities. The short axis scan of this, the short axis of this diagram is even more important because it actually brings home the point how important this area of the rotator interval is. The green is, of course, the coracohumeral ligament, which we have talked about, and forms the roof of the rotator interval. Underneath, of course, it is the short head of the, uh, the short axis of the bicipital tendon, the long head of the bicipital tendon, the superior glenohumeral ligament flanked by the leading edges of supraspinatus fibers as well as that of subscapularis. Now, if you have observed that there is a part of the capsule which is the anterior superior capsule and has a free edge which is most commonly involved in adhesive capsulitis, hence the entire inflammation encompasses the rotator interval. The other structure, of course, is in the axillary recess or in the, in, along the inferior uh, capsule. And this is a redundant part of the capsule which provides, helps to provide a great mobility to the shoulder joint at the expense, of course, the stability. Now, the inferior glenohumeral ligament also gets involved in the adhesive capsulitis, leading to the capsular contraction of the capsule that is present in the axillary recess. And this entire image would give you an overview when we start doing the ultrasound. So moving on to the coracohumeral ligament, which is of course the force, may the force be with you. And if you are able to interpret the coracohumeral ligament on an ultrasound in adhesive capsulitis, that's the point where a a good diagnosis can be provided to the clinician. Um, we have already discussed how the capsule is, um, is um, covered by a part of the triangular strong fibrous structure which extends from the coracoid process up to the tuberosities. It also gives the strength to the severe part of the shoulder by stabilizing it runs, of course, obliquely downwards and laterally from the coracoid process and blends with the supraspinatus and the capsule. Now, this has got two um, bands, the anterior and the posterior band, which cannot be very clearly discerned either on the, uh, on the ultrasound. They are bands that run together. The posterior band, of course, blends with the posterior capsule and the, uh, and the uh, supraspinatus and the anterior free edge of this uh, of this coracohumeral ligament blends intimately with the, excuse me, I think I've lost the pointer here. Um, yeah, so uh, it blends with the subscapularis and the free hedge overhangs and gives the stability to the bicipital tendon. On the sonar image that is there, it is a long axis scan starting from the coracoid process going on to the bicipital uh, 
uh, on to the short axis of the bicipital tendon. You have the rotator interval right here. And if you can just stretch your imagination, you'll be able to see a nice, thin, hypoechoic band extending all the way, going over the shoulder and blending with the rotator interval just superior to the bicipital tendon. The echogenic margins of the humeral head can be seen very clearly, along with that of the part of the coracoid ligament. Uh, the subcoracoid fat triangle that we were talking about would lie somewhere here in the subcoracoid region or just underneath the coracohumeral ligament, and we'll be able to see in subsequent images. The illustration that you can see in the top image, in the top of the slide here, shows the coracohumeral ligament in much more clarity, which is also finding, forming the biceps pulley. So coracohumeral ligament along with the subscapularis and the small end of the superior glenohumeral ligament goes on to form what we call as the biceps pulley. It drapes anteriorly and superiorly over the supraspinatus and blends with the capsule underneath. So in the image that you can see, the sauna image, which is a parallel of the diagrammatic representation here, you can very well visualize that there is a coracohumeral ligament which on eyeballing looks definitely thickened and has a thickening which was actually measured to 3.9 millimeters, just, uh, the up, the, just the upper limit where we have the cutoff at four millimeters in neutral position. And when you do an external rotation, this is still under observation of about 0 0.7 millimeters. Just sharing the cine clip, which is interrogating the coracohumeral ligament in external as well as internal rotations and showing the physiological changes of the thickness of the coracohumeral ligament, but with no limitation of movement, as you can well see. The triangular fat pad in this, the triangular fat pad in this image can be seen just underneath the coracohumeral ligament, which is hypoechoic, right here the hypoechoic, extending all the way from the coracoid process and going over the shoulder, blending with the rotator interval where you can see the landmark, of course, is the short head, short uh, axis of the bicipital tendon. The leading edges of subscapularis can be very well visualized at this level, which are well marked. And there is, of course, the supraspinatus, which can be seen partially. But the clarity with which the coracohumeral ligament is getting delineated here is the landmark that needs to be evaluated on each ultrasound when evaluating the adhesive capsulitis patient. So these are further images, and you can see in the upper top image that coracohumeral ligament is a substantial, we keep repeating because it's the most important and most constant thickening of the fibrous capsule of the shoulder. It is somewhat a trapezoidal shaped structure, which again extends from coracoid up to the rotator interval, and joins the capsule and inserts on the both ends of the tuberosity. So you can see on the lesser tuberosity where it takes the, the free edge goes on to the lesser tuberosity to a little extent and the posterior blends with the supraspinatus, the posterior band, and with the capsule underneath. The short axis, of course, of the long head of the biceps becomes the landmark for us to see that the rotator interval is right into the vision. The triangular fat pad, of course, is again, if I can bring you back the triangular fat pad, and if this gets obliterated and we have a few cine clips for you to put your attention where this triangular fat pad actually is the place which indicated that there is a pathology lying here. Another of the clips here, where you can see the coracohumeral ligament, a hyperechoic band extending from the coracoid process going all the way over the shoulder and over the rotator interval forming the roof of the rotator interval and showing a consistent even thickening.
Uh, this is just an illustration that I just wanted to mark, which uh, needs to be interpreted and needs to be kept in mind when we go to the subsequent slides. Uh, this, this part of which you see, the peach-colored structure, is a redundant and a loosely formed capsule. And the blue band that you see is the coracohumeral ligament, and you can well appreciate that's of even thickness quite long going from the coracoid process up to the uh, level where it takes its insertion. In comparison to what happens in adhesive capsulitis, the entire capsule is contracted. There is a significant loss of volume. Not only there is a significant loss of volume, there is a scarring of the underlying tissue, which would definitely lead to the reduced movement. But more importantly, what you see here is a thick band, which is shortened band of the coracohumeral ligament. So the shortening as well as the thickening are important parameters whilst evaluating coracohumeral ligament. Uh, this is, of course, an asymptomatic shoulder with a symptomatic shoulder, so I would really like to keep them in your mind of what we saw. For the symptoma asymptomatic shoulder, this was the right shoulder, and you can see that subscapularis in the external rotation has moved all the way outwards. Coracohumeral ligament is stretching out beautifully from the coracoid process, as you can see here, going all the way up to the rotator interval externally, and that is, of course, the coracohumeral ligament, the triangular fat pad coracoid process, absolutely nothing to indicate that we may be having a pathology sitting here. Whilst coming back in the internal rotation, a free movement, no restriction at all, and no thickening. Versus when we see for an affected shoulder with adhesive capsulitis. And as you can see here, the coracoid process, we will talk about the coracoid process in, in a little while, but the coracoid process and the subscapularis, and you can see the kind of restriction, which is not a functional restriction. It has become almost a mechanical restriction, as if there is a wall sitting there. Why does it happen? When you compare the coracohumeral ligament from the asymptomatic side, what you see here is a thickened coracohumeral ligament. There is absolute loss of the subcutaneous, the subacromial subcoracoid fat pad. As you are seeing the fat pad in this region, there is absolutely no fat pad. There is a very thickened coracohumeral ligament sitting here. And moreover, what needs to be paid attention to is how short the coracohumeral ligament has become as compared to the normal one. Normal one, if I'm just going to run it again, you can see the extent or the length of the elasticity with which the coracohumeral ligament goes externally as compared to here, where there's just a very shortened, a short, thick coracohumeral ligament, loss of the subcoracoid fat pad, thickened um, coracohumeral ligament at the uh, attachment of the coracoid process, and not only that, you could see that there is an irregularity of the coracoid process, which is showing that there had to be probably an injury or a tear sitting um, in the... So this actually falls into the post-thawing chronic adhesive capsulitis stage. If only rotator interval would not have reacted to the inflammation of the capsule, we would still probably have shoulders that are not too bad as the one that we've just seen in the cine clip. So the rotator interval, how do we define it? It's a very simple definition. It is an anatomic space which is bounded by subscapularis, supraspinatus, coracoid, and superiorly, the coracohumeral ligament. So we have the space which has also contents of superior glenohumeral ligament. So we have subscapularis and the superior glenohumeral ligament. Supraspinatus leading edge, these are the um, anterior fibers of the supraspinatus and the superior fibers of subscapularis, which are covered at the roof by the coracohumeral ligament, which is nice and thin, well-defined. The rotator interval space is extremely well defined here. And if I bring you to the arc that is seen in the diagrammatic illustration here, it is at this level where we have reproduced the sonar image. The oval region that we have just seen in this 
diagram or an illustration remains actually the hallmark where all the cases of frozen shoulder adhesive capsulitis should be really brought to attention. The probe orientation is seen in the red band for your attention. So, so what happens at rotator interval? There are two things primarily that we want to see at rotator interval. The one, of course, is the coracohumeral ligament. We've already discussed that in great detail, which forms the roof and blends very easily with the supraspinatus tendon on one side and the subscapularis and blending with the capsule. The second, of course, change that comes with adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder is post-inflammation, there is a hypoechoic proliferation or synovial proliferation, which goes on to become scar tissue at a later time. And this develops at the level of the rotator interval or other proportions or other regions which are involving the capsule. Presence of a power Doppler signal indicates that there is a hypervascularity or an activity sitting there, and this can be seen in the early stages of the rotator uh, cuff uh, of the adhesive capsulitis. Now, the power signal which results from the hypervascular scar at the rotator interval may not be seen in the later stages of the diseases. It's something that is seen in early stages where the synovial proliferation is happening. And it is there from the freezing to partly frozen stages of adhesive capsulitis. Lee et al. demonstrated that it has a sensitivity and specificity almost between 97 to 100% when we see a hypoechoic proliferative tissue with the hypervascularity within. Additionally, of course, we see for the coracohumeral ligament where we say that if there is a thickening which is greater than four millimeters, we are really talking about 60% sensitivity and 95% specificity for underlying adhesive capsulitis. This condition, of course, can also be associated with edema or fluid in the rotator interval. Now, when we are talking of the soft tissue proliferation, what exactly do we mean by the region of rotator interval where you see rotator, uh, where we, you see the synovial proliferation? When we are talking of that this is a normal scan, and I'll just walk you through with the structures that need to be addressed uh, for the uh, frozen shoulder evaluation. What we of course see here is the supraspinatus. On one side of course will be the coracoid process with subscapularis, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the cortical surface of the humeral head, short axis of the longer of the bicipital tendon which is present in the rotator interval. Over and above that you can very clearly see the coracohumeral ligament right here, thin, well-defined, distinct, and so are the borders of the bicipital tendon versus when we have a pathology, and this is a pathology where you can see a very nice term had been introduced to describe the region in which we see for the synovial proliferation or the formation of the hypertrophic scar. What we see here is the bicipital tendon, short axis, great, and this hypoechoic tissue, which is present between the tendon, tendon, sheath interface. Now this was a terminology which helped delineate and document what region are we exactly talking about. So when we are talking of tendon, tendon sheath interface, we are talking of tendon sheath of the bicipital tendon and we are talking of the tendon, the leading edge of the subscapularis here and the supraspinatus here and surrounding that would be the synovial proliferation or the hypoechoic tissue that you see sometimes with vascularity here no vascularity so we are really talking about just a scar tissue which is probably in the frozen or the thawing phase and of course leading to the restriction of the movement at the level of the when we are wanting to see for the external rotation. So this is just a fibrotic tissue and not a synovial proliferation at this point of time. So when we are talking soft tissue proliferation and we are talking, we have just seen a case where there was a scar tissue formed but no vascularity. Here was a case where we found that in the evolving stages of adhesive capsulitis, maybe from freezing to frozen state, we did a grayscale imaging and we found that there was a synovial proliferation in the rotator interval between the tendon-tendon sheath interval. 
there was thickening of the coracal humeral ligament and on a static imaging we could see that there was a, a Doppler a map that we could raise in the rotator interval. This is of course the normal image that you could always compare. So what you see here is the hypoechoic proliferation versus nothing, a very distinct supraspinatus and the subscapularis with distinct margins of the bicipital tendon and a thin coracohumeral ligament which is sitting up here, the orientation and of course in the real life subject the probe orientation sitting here. This video clip is just to demonstrate how the proliferation and the color Doppler imaging helps us to give a very strong diagnosis that this is in the early stages or the uh, or in the freezing stages or the painful stage, the first stage of development of the adhesive capsulitis in the rotator interval, multiple signals that are raised, raised and of course the ill-defined bicipital tendon, uh, the leading edges were not very absolutely clear because of the synovial proliferation, however the vascularity was diagnostic of adhesive capsulitis. After having discussed so many other structures, we are talking rotator interval, we are talking a coracohumeral ligament, we come to something that was introduced not so long ago, and that is the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And this is relatively a new sonar sign and gives a higher degree of diagnostic efficacy. So, so when we are talking of the capsule, we'll first go backwards. We are talking of the synovium, and this synovium is redundant, mainly loose, giving a great mobility to the shoulder joint. We see, of course, the part of the synovium extending into the long head of the bicipital tendon, giving the sheath or recesses that get formed of the subscapularis recess and the axillary pouch of the synovial sheath with the capsule. We have already seen that the capsule over and above it is firmly attached but has a redundancy in the axillary region along the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Coracohumeral ligament, of course, is fanning out as we have discussed in previous slides. Now, this Inferior glenohumeral ligament, of course, gives strength to the capsule in the inferior region. Coracohumeral ligament in the superior region, starting from the superior region or the anterior superior of the coracohumeral and between the inferior glenohumeral ligament, you've got two more ligaments, that is the middle, uh, that is the superior glenohumeral ligament and the middle glenohumeral ligament, which strengthen the capsule and give stability uh, to the shoulder. Uh, to the shoulder. Moving from here, I've just introduced these two slides just to bring about an overview of the pathology and we can see that this is a conventional arthrogram versus the MR arthrogram and in the conventional arthrogram you can see that of course there is a pouch which is again a loose redundant pouch and contrast is filling it up very adequately versus the pathology where you can see the contractures, you can see the irregularities and complete loss of this um, synovial recess in the axillary as well as in other regions. The same which we can see a nice filling up of the axillary pouch versus the contraction and loss of the volume and hardly any contrast that goes in the MR arthrogram. So when we are talking of the axillary recess, ultrasound actually became a very important diagnostic modality because we all remember and we all know that both the earlier modalities that we had seen were invasive modalities with their own side effects. So when we come to the ultrasound study of the axillary region and the evaluation in inferior glenohumeral ligament along with the capsule, it was quicker, safer, and a reproducible um, modality for capsular thickening. Now, shoulders with adhesive capsulitis characteristically fibrose and thicken in the axillary pouch, and there are these are three cases that I have illustrated here. Uh, this is, of course, which was a milder form where you could see in the inferior one, which is an asymptomatic shoulder, and you could see the at the level of the anatomic neck of the humerus, the capsule taking its attachment, and it's kind of nice and thin and well-defined, versus where you can see on eyeballing that there is a thickening sitting here. And this was the milder forms of adhesive capsulitis. So I'm going to move on to the next one, which was little more than mild form. And not only that, there was a thickening of the axillary region, there was, of course, a little bit of a fluid also that filled in 
the um, axillaricus. So the total capsule inferior glenohumeral complex formed a thickening, which led to quite a significant disability in the patient, versus, of course, this was a case which was absolutely a classic case a normal glen inferior glenohumeral ligament with a capsule taking its attachment versus a thickening which was so big that the patient could hardly move the shoulder at all. So once we are talking of the static scanning, grayscale scanning or color Doppler, it is just very important that limited reaching is noted particularly during the overhead activities there is a lot of disability in the patients. They are having a loss of the quality. And, you know, small functions like hanging the clothes or fastening the seat belt in the car, the restrictions that come because of the, uh, of, without, without saying so, but the personal hygiene does get affected of these patients because if it's in the right shoulder, they're unable to brush with the dominant right hand or even do their hair, comb their hair. So it becomes quite a lot of disability in a patient who is otherwise physically very active. In MSK ultrasound, missing out on a dynamic scan is like throwing away ice cream and just eating the cone. So dynamic evaluation is performed for both the tendons of subscapularis as well as supraspinatus because we want to see the free gliding movement of both the tendons in the rotator interval in order to establish what kind of and what degree of disability of the moment of shoulder exists, which cannot be done on a static scan. Of course, yeah, clinically we can, but if we want to document on an ultrasound, it's absolutely imperative that a dynamic evaluation needs to be done. So for the movement of the humeral head and the supraspinatus underneath the acromial process in abduction, dynamic scan really helps in early identification of the disease or the evolving stage of the disease. Limited gliding and visibility of supraspinatus tendon and the acromion process and partial exposition of subscavularis in external rotation in the later stages of the diseases are really a very useful adjunct when we're talking of adhesive capsulitis and doing just a static grayscale scanning. So this is just one of the videos that I'm showing here of this elderly gentleman who presented to us with adhesive capsulitis. The cause was secondary here due to CVA, and there was, of course, a restriction of the moment of abduction. Uh, the, the restriction of the abduction is performed with the patient, of course, sitting in front of you, and the scanning plane is in the anterior superior region with a probe orientation in long axis. The video clip showed that he had limitation of movement at about 60 degrees. So it goes through the arc. This is an arc. It starts at zero degrees and the shoulder is abducted all the way up to the 90 degrees. The grading of this restriction of movement is done through mild, moderate and severe. So we would say that it is a severe restriction if the patient is unable to move from 45 degrees to 60 degrees. And of course, it is a normal shoulder if the patient can take it 90 degrees or above. Um, in this dynamic imaging of the cine clip that I'm sharing here with you, supraspinatus, the greater tuberosity, acromion process, deltoid of course, and over that is bursa, which of is minimally thickened, but that is not the reason why there was a restriction of the movement. It was a capsular uh, contraction that led to that led to a restriction of the movement in this gentleman through the entire arc and just stopping short of going underneath the acromion. When we are talking about the exposition of the external rotation of the subscapularis tendon through external rotation. There are a few of these um, video clips that I'm going to be sharing and um, just going to go back. Um, this is a video clip that we took uh, where the external and internal rotation is performed when the elbow is just put flush against the body and taking it through the arc from internal to external rotation. However, if the patient is in too much pain, the patient can lie down also in a manner like this and the active and passive movement can be done by the operator. Because do remember that when we are talking of adhesive capsulitis, 
The active as well as the passive movement is not only restricted but is painful versus other pathologies when we are talking really of uh, rotator cuff tears, we are talking of even subacromial subdeltoid bursitis. The active movement is painful and restricted but if you want to move the shoulder passively, we are actually able to move it without much pain to the patient. So uh, this was a great technique. I'm just going to stop this video for a little while. So a documentation for the restricted, we've already done documentation for the um, abduction, restriction of abduction from mild to moderate, that the arc is being taken through the zero to 90 degrees. Uh, there was definitely no definitive documentation of giving for the subscapularis. Now there was a study that was done by Manix Van Holspeek and he created and he described this observation how to validate whether the exposition of the subscapularis is enough and what is the degree of uh, restriction of the external rotation. So he mapped the translation. He mapped the translation. I'm just going to bring it here to you. And this is what is popularly called as the V of the subscapularis, which takes its insertion on the lesser tuberosity. So what he did was that he mapped the entire exposition into a clock-like manner. So for the right shoulder, the V of the subscapularis, which takes its insertion at lesser tuberosity, needs to go through the entire arc from 12 o'clock to 7 o'clock position for us to say this is a free movement. In a similar manner, on the left side, it needs to go from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock position or beyond for us to say that this is a normal exposition of the subscapularis. So we're just going to go first from the asymptomatic side. This is the right shoulder with asymptomatic side. And as we start from the 12 o'clock position, you can see how the V of the subscapularis is going way beyond, way beyond from 9 o'clock, to seven o'clock. It's a free movement with a free exposition of the entire subscapularis, including up to the musculotendinous junction. And you can also see that the stretch of the coracohumeral ligament is absolutely fantastic going all the way from the coracoid process up to the uh, rotator interval. Now, if I'm going to come here and um, show you the restriction of the moment. This was the left shoulder, which was having a restriction of the moment. So as we are going through and seeing the V of the subscapular, sub, subscapularis, excuse me, you could see that once the moment started and the external rotation was being performed, this is of course the coracoid process, we could see that it would stop short at two o'clock position, giving it a grading of moderate kind of restriction of external rotation versus a normal one. So um, this is some, something which can be documented and it can actually be carried on forward to give to the consultant for the understanding of the degree of the disability or degree of restriction, which can be uh, uh, which can be there in adhesive capsulitis, besides, of course, the other findings of thickening of the coracohumeral ligament or the proliferation or the scar tissue that is there at the rotator interval, whether there is vascularity or not a vascularity gives you different stages of the adhesive capsulitis from the freezing to the thawing stage. So to summarize the solar signs of frozen shoulder adhesive capsulitis, they can be just as follows. There is a limitation of movement of subscapularis. That means a limited external rotation, which is a very sensitive feature on a dynamic scan. Thickened coracohumeral ligament, which should be greater than four millimeters at any point of time, or maybe eyeballing. The axillary recess capsular thickening can go anywhere from four millimeters to 13 millimeters. Subcoracoid fat triangle sign is an important sign if you can elicit it and bring it out to say that it is obliterated. Relative hypoechoic material around the long head of the biceps at the rotator interval, and of course, a variable Doppler signal intensity in the synovium within the axillary recess as well as at the rotator interval. Take home points are the same. Ultrasound helps to exclude articular or non articular rotator cuff pathologies in order to give a definite diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis 
Thickening of coracoid humeral ligament and inferior glenohumeral ligaments are hallmark of adhesive capsulitis. Restriction of extreme external rotation, both active as well as passive. Rotator interval fat pad obliteration and presence of soft tissue proliferation. And last but not the least, ultrasound is a great modality if you should want to use as guided procedures for the treatment. Good night and I thank you all for joining us once again.